two years. <laughs> so. All right, well, welcome everybody to the Jonesboro Rotary Club meeting for today. And um, we'll get started first by John. Will you introduce your guest, please? Love to introduce my guest. I am glad to have Mr. Elvis Person here. Don't insert your Elvis joke here because he hears it all the time. So sorry. And uh, Elvis and I know each other. He actually knows a lot of folks in the room, and I wasn't surprised by that. We go to a lot of uh, chamber functions, and we keep seeing each other. And a tip of the hat to the Rotary Club is that Elvis works with Salvation Army. He used to work with uh, David Spivey as well. And he, he says to me at a networking event, you know, John, you're the Rotary Club, huh? A lot of volunteers uh, are Rotarians, and they seem like pretty nice people. Well, that's just an invitation for me to say, good, come on, have lunch with us. <laughs> really, it is. So thanks for being here, Elvis. And uh, anything you want to say about yourself? No more than I'm just happy to be here. And I, again, I'm with the Salvation Army. And if you know, know of anyone that needs help, of any, just come to the Salvation Army, and we'll do, we'll do everything we can to help them. We've got about and, 15 people here. Need help. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, and also too, it, we have there's two two uh, Rotary clubs in Sanford, Sanford and Jonesboro. We're the Jonesboro club. Uh, as Rotarians, we have actually reached out to Salvation Army to volunteer there. So, if you are interested in our club, which we would certainly hope that you are, we could keep that going. We currently volunteer the third Thursday at CUOC. So if you do need volunteers, I'm trying to say that we might could work something out. Okay. Because it, it's a community service organization that we're involved in. So yeah, we can arrange that. Yeah. That's what I thought. So anyways, make up the welcome. <laughs> Announcements. We will be having pints for polio on the first meeting of October 4th for the Satellite Club. And that's a joint venture with Sanford Rotary. So we'll have a good turnout that day at Camelback between our two clubs and to be pints for polo. Other announcements for Rotary? And are you going to bring animals? I'm, I'm going to bring some pint-sized animals. I don't know what I'm going to bring yet. I've got to talk to Mike about kind of space, but yeah. something that people can hold and take pictures and, and love on, and since they're pint-sized and we're doing pints for polio, we figured it would be a good, you know, tie. What, what, what is the, uh, how does that work? So what we're thinking of is, other Rotary clubs have done this before. It, it's not necessarily our, brainstorm, but um, maybe uh, a dollar for every beer purchased will go to Polio Plus campaign to eradicate polio. So, it, it's, so it's, it's a gratuitous way just to raise funds for something that we already do, which is hang out, drink beer, have fun, and all that kind of good stuff. Didn't we do something like that a couple years ago? Uh, the Sanford Club did three years ago, pre-COVID, and it was a lot of fun, and this, their then president, Mark, had put a Spider-Man costume on and rappelled down from the building. It was fun. So, that's it. All right, other announcements for Rotary. Patrick, can you bring some animals in <laughs> There's nothing that would hold up anybody in this room. <laughs> that might not be a good idea. <laughs> that, that might not be a good idea. Don't video that one. We might get hurt. That <laughs> That's right. Other announcements. Yes, sir. I'm not going to be here when we volunteer for uh, backpack in October the 20th. Uh, if somebody could take care of arranging for just sending out the notices, mm -hmm. that, that'd be good. I'm going to be down at the University of Alabama. Oh, going to the game? Yeah. Are you sitting awesome. up? Yeah. And we're, 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 we're taking my father's down. Oh, you we're are. Giving it back. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Is that on my Auburn game? Uh, no, this is Mississippi State. Oh. Auburn doesn't have that good a team this year. Do you <laughs> yes, thank you. Larry, Larry what, did, what did you say you're bringing, bringing back? Uh, my dad in 1932 won the best all-around athlete award at the University of Alabama. Wow. It's called the Porter Cup. Uh -huh. And uh, he also was, uh, and I mentioned this before too, uh, a really good friend of Bear Bryant. So there's a Bear Bryant Museum down there in Tuscaloosa. And they want the trophy. They don't have a copy of the Porter Cup. Wow. It was given for about 15 or 16 years. And Dad won the last one, and other years after that, they gave it individually to sports, but they never gave an all-round award wow. after my dad died. That's cool. So uh, all of my grandkids and everybody's going 
going down and we make a presentation oh, wow. to the museum. That's cool. That's very nice. So you won't be on the field when we make a presentation? No, this, uh, this is Saturday morning at the board game gotcha. at the museum. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to be holding oh. that with you. Go down to Other announcements? How about Bragg's? I got a... You got a brag, Terry? I got my money out. I brought bragging money to me. I'll stand beside you. All right. Go, go ahead. I always like stand up. No, no, no. You You're in the How much is it? How much is it? A dollar. A dollar. A dollar. Well, Oh, we can do it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, a couple couple day, couple weeks ago, I was down in Littleton, Littleton with Elaine Marshall, and I realized I had to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to recoup my mistake that I made from another speech that I made. Okay, I'm not a politician, so I do make mistakes. Uh, I was down in down in Littleton with Elaine Marshall, then I realized I had to um, to like go video or. or funeral service for a policeman who had died. So I got in my little car and I drove from Lillerton to Silo City at a nice 55 miles an hour. And I got there on time and I videoed the policeman funeral. And so it, it was a good job. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is because I, you know, I made another statement. I drove 119 miles an hour, but it wasn't. <laughs> oh, no. Wow! I drove my Porsche. It was only 55. So, if any of the nice policemen out there, first responders, see this video, I did drive double nickels, 55. It wasn't 119. <laughs> so, I just want to apologize to you for it saying I drove 119. You, you got a certificate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got a, I got a certificate. We have special guests in the studio, and this morning. We are going to honor Terry McMillan. Uh, he didn't know anything about this, like he never knows anything about anything. Somebody has to get it. But Terry, today is your day because a couple of weeks ago, it was a sad occasion. A Sanford police officer retired, passed away. His name was Roderick Rod Murdoch from Chatham County. And the police officers and some friends got together and thought, we need to honor Terry McMillan because he went beyond the call of duty to come in and video the entire funeral and the gathering of friends afterward because they asked you and you told them you couldn't do it because you had another job in Harnett County. Mm -hmm. And you gave up the job in Harnett County because it was a police officer. Mm -hmm. The Sanford police officer sends their regrets. This morning there was not one person who was able to come here and they asked us at the studio if we would present to you a plaque for your outstanding service and you will never be forgotten. And your plaque reads, Terry McMillan, owner Brick Capital Video LLC and appreciation. Thank you for going above and beyond and providing the documented memories from retiree senior officer Frederick Rod Murdoch's homegoing service. Rod's family, community, and fellow officers with the Sanford Police Department and surrounding agencies who served with him over his 25-year police career will be able to reflect and enjoy these memories through video over a lifetime. Your dedication in preparing a professional yet heartfelt video is much appreciated. Mr. McMillan, you are a pillar of the Sanford community and the services you provide bring forth everlasting memories to all. Presented this first day of September, it is the 12th of September, but this was prepared for the first. On behalf of retiree senior Frederick Rod Murdoch's family and the City of Sanford Police Department, B. Shift, and it's signed by his widow, Aretha Murdoch, uh, Captain Jones, and Sergeant Stephen Applewhite of the Sanford Police Department. They want you to have this beautiful plaque. Also, they want you to have a video of the services, and they've sent you programs and color of the service. And again, they say thank you. We say thank you. We always know we can always count on Terry to do something good for somebody else. And we have others out there who will shake your hand as you go out the door. <laughs> thank you very much. Would you like to say one word? Yes. I would like to say to Frederick Murdoch family, 
I was honored whenever I got the call to video your husband home going. And I'd like for you to know that all the first responders in Sanford and Lee County is with you during this time and they'll be with you today and they'll be with you tomorrow. And if I can help you in any form or fashion, please reach out and give me a call and I'll be there for you also. So have a blessed day and just remember Sanford and Lee County is keeping your family in prayers. For driving 55 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I have apologized. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I clear, cleared that one up. You got another one, Terry? Or are you good? Okay. All right. <laughs> Real quick, I'll brag on the uh, Sanford Lions Club for all that it did last week, along with the Carpenter Extension Agency and everybody that took a hand in the Lee Regional Fair. It was a great turnout. It was a tiring week. I was there every day this week, just like Bill was and everybody else. And uh, it's always a great community event. So, any other announcements or brags? Yes, sir. I got to brag on the temple. Uh, if you haven't seen Beehive, you, you really need to go see it. it. It was just a fabulous musical that they put on, and the talent that they put up on that stage year in, year out is just absolutely amazing. So, if we've got Today at 2, Friday, Saturday, and I think Sunday afternoon. So if you get a chance, go see it, because it, it's, it's about the, the 60s music, the, the girl groups, and, and uh, the ladies. <clears throat> the girl does Tina Turner and Aretha Franklin like there's nobody else's business. <laughs> and the girl does Janis Joplin extremely well. So, I mean, it's, it's very good. So. Go see it to get a chance. And since I'm a member of the Temple and you're my friend, I'm going to pay you a dollar for you. All right. Give me a dollar. Thank you. That's 10. That's 10. That's a 10. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad, Thank you, Terry. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> you got nine more breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Quick little update for presenters that are coming in for the upcoming meetings. We've obviously got Bill Stone and Amanda Wilkins today with the Ag Department, but October 13th meeting, we have Jimmy Randolph with Saga <coughs> coming to join us. October 27th, we've got Dr. Andy Bryan with the Lee County Schools. Mm. I don't have anybody for the 10th of November, so this is my notification. If you've got anybody you wanna hear from, ask them to come join us and fill that spot. Zach West with Sanford Contractors will be joining us December 8th. I don't have anybody for the 22nd. I don't know if we're meeting a couple days before Christmas, so to be determined. That's all I've got for the year end, but certainly group effort. If there's people you want to hear from, get them on the list. For the November meeting, reach out to the Temple Theater and see if they can't come and promote a Christmas carol. I think is what we're doing. Okay, that's a good idea. So we're not meeting next week, right? No, no, no. Right. Uh, can't get Dr. John, John, John. Um, Crumpton? Yeah. He came two meetings yeah, ago. We just, just had him. Just had him. Did he, he do a show? Yeah. He did. Danced and everything. <laughs> Anything else? <clears throat> appreciate y'all y'all inviting us to do the program um, I'm really excited because I've actually seen this program before and after Amanda did it and, and I had talked with Zach I thought the group would really enjoy this um, Amanda Wilkins uh, has been with us since I guess August right? August 1st first of August so she's still kind of a newbie uh, but she comes to us with extensive horticulture experience and we're very we've been very fortunate to uh, to have her join our team um, her and she'll she may talk a little bit about her her former work lives but most recently she came from um, a, a world famous botanical garden uh, outside of Raleigh juniper level and um, I knew I knew we had a really good one when the first or second day uh, Amanda and I were riding around and I was just kind of giving her a tour of the county and taking her around and showing her everything and we were driving down the road I think we were in Broadway 
and she just start, starts rolling off the Latin, the botanical names, Latin names of everything along the road. I don't know if she was accurate or, or naming the right words, but I was impressed. It seemed like she knew what she was talking about. I was like, I, you know, so so she's extremely knowledgeable. Um, she is uh, she's hit the ground running, really uh, outgoing and and uh, team oriented, and has. Uh, already provided great customer service and made a positive impact. So I'm excited for y'all to meet her and get to know her, and I will turn it over to Amanda. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hire Bill to do all my introductions. <laughs> um, speaking of like, I'm slipping in, I think I'm gonna slip you a 10 later, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so, uh, I don't know how I can follow that. My name is Amanda Wilkins, um, and I am a horticulture agent for the county. Um, I am a millennial, so you know you have to forgive me a little bit. I'm going to make some silly jokes that may or may not make sense because I just can't help it. They kind of roll into my presentations. Um, and it's a good thing. Oh, man, this, I know it's true. Um, this is kind of what I do. <coughs> me giving a mandatory plant tour to everyone who comes to visit. Uh, I am a horticulturist at heart. I went to NC State for horticultural science. Um, I graduated in 2013 with also a degree as minors in sustainable agriculture and plant biology. Um, I have worked at eight botanical gardens in my career, um, all the way from, I worked at Duke and the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. I've also worked at the National Tropical Botanical Garden in Hawaii. And I did my master's at the University of Edinburgh, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, in the biodiversity and taxonomy of plants. So all that rattling off of random names comes unfortunately very natural to me. But it makes people do what Woody from Toy Story is doing over there sometimes, because it does sometimes seem like, are you making that up? <laughs> and I just, I was, I was told him, I said, yeah, I can't make it up. I, unfortunately, I wish I could make up some silly name of some silly plant, but unfortunately the botanists have already probably named a silly plant after that thing. So um, most recently though, I was working at Juniper Level Botanic Garden as the, cur the garden curator there, um, and this is a scene from the garden there. We're just going to take a really quick jaunt through the garden, through some pretty pictures. If some of y'all aren't gardeners, I imagine y'all have wives, mothers, grandmothers, neighbors who probably also like plants. So, you know, if you see something that you like that seems like something that they would like to, to maybe <coughs> add to their garden or that you would like to see them add to their garden so you don't have to manage it, um, hopefully this will be a little bit of inspiration for you. Um, so I do have to do the disclaimer, I'm going to try not to speak too much Latin. That was my training. Um, and, and for gardeners, that's really important because that's where, that's how you get the plant that you want. You know, you can go out and get, you know, buy a tractor seat plant from somebody, but there's a lot of things that are called tractor seat plants and it may not be the thing that you thought was a tractor seat plant. Um, and then sometimes for gardeners, um, nativity matters. There's a lot of really bad stuff happening around. Um, and for gardeners also, uh, the joke here is I want a maintenance free landscape that blooms year round and makes food. <laughs> There's no such thing. There's always gonna be some sort of work that goes with gardening. And I try and give people that kind of dose of reality that there's always gonna be some sort of work. If you talk to a farmer, they're working from sun up until sundown and gardeners can pretty much tell you the same thing. Um, which is okay, you know, what else, what better way to spend your life than outside. Um, so there's a few things that affect what's going to be going in your garden, and I love this picture. So I was the curator of collections at the Mobile Botanical Gardens in Mobile, Alabama for three years. And this is a picture of Felder Rushing, uh, who is a, a garden commentator on the NPR station in Mississippi. Um, and he drives around down I-10 with this pickup truck with real live plants growing in the back of it to prove the point that you can grow plants anywhere, including in the back of a pickup truck. Um, but knowing, knowing what kind of conditions are in your yard is really going to dictate what kind of plants because he has been very specific about which ones do well, which ones don't. He actually gives a presentation to people about what has failed in, the pick, in his pickup truck going down I-10. <laughs> So this is a little scene from the botanical garden I used to work at, and thankfully I was very fortunate to work with a, a lively group of master gardeners and volunteers and a very lively staff. Um, and in this scene, you're probably looking at about 1,500 unique plants from around the world. 
Um, and as you can see, it's an army of people kind of scattered throughout. There's some people behind a, a yucca over there, and there's somebody up here by a picnic bench, and one of my employees, Christian, was kind of pointing to somebody with some flags. Um, at any given time, this trailer, we pulled it behind a tractor, held probably about three yards of material, and we'd take out one to six of those out of the garden a day. Um, so it was, it was work, but it was good. So I went from having a botanical garden of about 30,000 unique plants down to this, and this is the Pollinator Haven Garden. If y'all have not been out to the Extension Office, y'all should go. Um, it does not look like this anymore because uh, Amanda went through there and gutted it. <laughs> we probably took out, I don't know, a third of what's in this view right now. And it wasn't really so much taking out the plants that weren't good, it was more of taking out the repeating plants with the intent to diversify the offerings. So right now, in this scene, there's about 50 unique plants. There's another 50 that we're gonna add, so we're doubling the diversity of plants. Um, and that'll, that'll enable me to tell some interesting stories for people about pollinators, which is one of my program focuses. That's always the big buzzword. And if you guys ever wanna donate some money to fund my crazy evil plans, Bill likes to call them. Um, so we're really excited about what's going on. So you guys, I'm going to flip through some really fun photos, tell you some fun stories, because I, I made this program for gardeners, and I understand that not everybody's, for gar not everybody's a gardener, but plants can still be very inspiring, and you know, can and sometimes just go, you know what, I do like that plant, you know, that I do find that interesting, and it is something to, fun to share with your um, with your family um, and there are some very passionate people in the world who this is what they do and they spend their entire life's work doing this um, so I, this is a picture I took of a Chefalera which is just fun to say it's related to this plant right here actually this one grows outside um, uh, and this is Kevin Paris who teaches the horticulture program at Spartanburg Community College in South Carolina and this has been one that he's actually been spreading around that we will have at the extension office, Bill, soon. <laughs> um, and I went to NC State, so I have to do a really quick shout out. This is um, a, a red bud. It's a Chinese red bud. So everybody knows red buds. You got one in your yard. You see them on the side of the road in February. This one, this is the one from China that flowers before all of our native ones. Um, and it is just a really great plant to put in the landscape. How, how long does that flower? That, that guy's flowered for about two weeks. There's, there is a flower bud all the way down to the ground, a little flower bud right down there, which is just insane. Um, and it, every early pollinator, honeybees on a warm day, this thing hums. Um, kind of a cool one that people are really fascinated by. This is a stacky uris. Um, so I live in Sanford. I live off of um, Steel Bridge Road and 42. And um, behind the D&D &D general store, if you know where that's at. Um, there's gonna be one of these in my front yard. I swear to goodness, I got two of them that are about this tall, and next year they're gonna be this tall and this wide, and you'll see this if you drive down the road, because it is that stunning from a distance. I'm also gonna have one of these. This is in the dead of winter. You can see there's just a few new, le few new leaves coming out. This is January, wow. um, uh, and I, I love this thing. <laughs> Evergreen foliage. The, the clematis that you usually see in September is flowers in, in January, so I love that. Um, shout out to uh, Deciduous Magnolias. I know Bill was, was very um, excited about this one. This is a um, name for Judy Zook, who was a famous horticulturist at um, Missouri Botanical Garden. And it's just buttery yellow with a blush of pink. And it's just so pretty when you got it against that blue sky. Oh, it's so cool. And this is my mom. Um, so I'm from Gaston County, which is west of Charlotte, um, and this plant is native to North America. It's Magnolia macrophylla, um, and my mom is about as tall as I am. So that plant, that flower is about that big around. Um, it is the largest flower and the largest leaf of any plant in North America. And uh, and I'm that crazy person that stops on the side of the road. This is the planting that Gaston County did in honor of the botanist, the French botanist who walked through there in 1717 and described that species in his, um, in his notebook. Um, so I know a lot of people deal with, with shade. There's a lot of potential for shade things. And I had a lot of, um, so part of my job is to go around and do needs 
assessments, you know, see what people want to do in the community, what they want to learn more about. And shade gardening is something that people struggle with. They have pine trees, they have oak trees, and so um, if you know of anybody who needs a little primer on how to grow in the shade, that's come let me know. I, I'm, I have a presentation for that. Because there are a, little, a lot of really beautiful plants, like this woodwardia. It's a huge fern um, that just looks really great. There are Asian orchids that will grow in the ground that, are, that will survive in our winters and have beautiful, stunning color in March. Um, and there are things that will be evergreen in the wintertime. A lot of times people plant stuff for that interest in the, the spring and the summer, but this, this picture I took in February in the garden at the Juniper level, and it's green. You know, it doesn't even look like winter. Um, and people who come from the north are always like, oh my gosh, it, it looks so, so tropical. And some of these tropical things actually do really well. I love this, um, this is Aspidistra zombii, which is fun to say, but I love the texture and the color of that leaf. It looks like that year round. Speaking of tractor seat plants, um, this was when I learned in Mobile, um, because the, the, the leaves look like old tractor seats. Um, but they flower in November. Um, I have one in my yard right now. It's, it's related to sunflowers. And look at those flowers, full flower in February. You can see all the, the fall leaves and the fall color. Um, and it is evergreen. So you get those really interesting, large, tractor seed leaves in the wintertime. Where would you find a seed for that? Or where would you find them that day? So Tony, Tony Avent at Plant Delight sells us. I know that sometimes John has it at Big Bloomers. Um, and uh, I sometimes give divisions away to people, but it's, it's around, it's around. Um, Tony has about 17 different ones where the leaves are this big to this big. I've never heard of that, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and a shade garden again, we'll shout out to that, but I wanted to highlight this fun plant. Some people call this alligator um, or spider lily. Um, and it's a native plant. It, grow, it likes to grow in um, wet places. Um, and I went to a, uh, we, part of my old job, we did plant rescues. And we went down to Florida to this guy's property. He had, he had 10 acres, and two of it was just full of these Rubbermaid bins, you know. And, all he, and they all had different kinds of lilies and irises that he had collected through his 30 years working for the APA. Um, so you'd just be like paddling down the bayous of Florida and just picking plants out of the water and he was growing them in these bins. And unfortunately, he was in his 90s and he was in the home and they were about to bulldoze the whole thing and we went down and rescued about 100 wild collected unique plants. And I've got about 40 of them at my house right now. So um, I'm super excited about these tulips. Um, I love tulips. This is one of the few tulips that are perennial in North Carolina. A lot of times you see them and see them this time of year, Lowe's and Home Depot has got their, you know, the black ones and the multicolored ones and so on and so forth. And they are annuals at best in our climate, just too hot. But this one, um, this one is uh, from the Mediterranean um, and it does not mind being in North Carolina and it will even seed around and you'll just have this coming up every year um, in March, I love it. Um, this time of year we have some, we also have summer flowering bulbs, the rain lilies, I just love that color. I have some in my yard and they flower after the rain. Rains one day, the next day, this thing is a carpet of flowers and it does that for three days after it rains and then they'll, they'll just be leaves and then if it rains again, they'll flower again and it's so pretty, wow. Um, they come in all sorts of colors. Um, like choruses, surprise lilies, hurricane lilies, <coughs> naked ladies is one I've also heard them called. Um, Tony, uh, the botanical garden that I worked at, um, they had a big collection of them. He has the largest collection in outside of Asia. Um, and they are flowering from August 1st until the middle of October. And they just, they're dormant in the summertime. And then in the fall, they just kind of pop up. They look like little sticks. And then they have flowers on top, and then the flowers finish, and they go back down. And then suddenly, these fo the foliage comes out, and you just kind of forget about them. Sometimes people plant them in their yards. You might know this one. This one's flower right now. Um, and just when you see them as a big block, they're really stunning. And that gentleman in the background. So I, who was I talking to earlier? We're talking to Bruce. 
Um, so that gentleman, that he uh, he's actually a breeder in Michigan. This is a this is a hibiscus <coughs> that he bred. Dark foliage, red flowers. It's called Holy Grail because that was his breeding goal, and he never thought he'd get there, and he got there. Um, and he's like, okay, well, I'll, I guess I'm done. He wasn't done. He they they came out with another thirty, but this is still a great plant. It does really well here. Um, Malviscus, I love saying that. Uh, big Mama. She's about this big, um, but she flowers later than most of the other hibiscus. And instead of being you know that wide, broad kind of dinner plate shape, that's that flower is open, and what it attracts is um, hummingbirds. So the hummingbirds will come to this. And this will be flowering from usually the beginning of September all the way until frost. It'll just keep pressing out flowers. All those little kind of bell looking things right there are all just future flower buds. Um, we can grow um, uh, ginger lilies here in this climate. And in fact, I was talking to a gentleman at NC State. Um, we're trying to diversify what farmers are growing and they have found that there are several of the ginger lilies that they can do production with in North Carolina. <laughs> so you might be able to find some Lee County grown ginger roots soon. Um, one that may not be so common, but maybe in the future, this is a Japanese ginger. And it's, it's probably, it's about to start flowering now, but in this little picture, there's some like little leaf looking stuff at the base of those leaves. And that is this flower here. They flower at the base, at the ground. And they, you can pickle them and stir fry them. You can grow bananas here. There's a couple of different cool ones. Um, just don't plant them at the base of your house. <laughs> um, I've noticed that some people have angel trumpets around. Um, I was at um, John Gross's farm this morning, and he has one of these behind one of his barns. Uh, it's one of my, my goals to have these, because they're flowering in October, which is really nice. Um, the Morton <coughs> Phallus, you can snicker and, and laugh. It does mean what it looks like. It, it, um, <laughs> it smells to high heaven. They usually flower about May. Um, this one smells like nail polish remover, and that one smells like somebody hit a raccoon two days ago in the middle of August. <laughs> um, is that the cor corpse flower? Is that the yeah, flower? it's it's related to the the corpse flower. This is just one that you can grow outside. The the one that they always tout about at NC State or at Mobot, those are tropical, but these will survive our winters in North Carolina. Um, mangaves, so people think agaves and they think spiky, nasty, it's going to take out my small child. Um, they have bred a, a new plant. They mixed two genera, genera together and made what's called a mangave. And while it looks spiky down here, it doesn't actually bite. So, And they flower more, which is kind of cool. Shout out to um, azaleas and things. I love azaleas. Um, and we're going to be adding some of these to the pollinator garden. These are native deciduous azaleas. Um, and even old guys who are nursery people will go out in the middle of, of the bed just taking pictures of these. Um, I love azalea society guys. They're so nice. Um, this is my friend Martin Vandergeesen who brought these to market. Um, and man, I mean, gosh, look at that all of that in the back, it's all those plants. So um, I'm going to stop there because I know I'm droning on. Um, and I'll leave you guys with this because we, we've we got about five of these different azaleas flowering up that will be hopefully flowering not next year, but the year after next in the Pollinator Haven Garden. And that's one of my big project areas as part of my program, really trying to uh, inspire more people to plant flowers for pollinators and think about how they're managing their gardens and their yards to be more pollinator friendly. So I appreciate all y'all's time and tolerance of me going on about cool plants. And um, yeah, have a great day. Amanda, when you moved here, yes, sir. did you look for a house or a garden? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so it was actually my boyfriend who bought the house, and he wants to start a farm. So we um, we have an acre and a half um, on the property that's behind the D&D store. Uh, and thankfully, there are it's designed in such a way that it has a big shop. So Joe is like, the shop is mine, everything around the house is mine, and everything else is yours, <laughs> um, which is very smart. <laughs> 
I probably have an acre to play with and um, right now I've killed off a bunch of grass to start putting things in the ground. It's getting a little crazy right now. Um, but thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, since you asked the last question, you said I'm leaving the four way test. <laughs> Okay, four-way traffic relationship. Thank you, Sam. First, is it true? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.